The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the king of the earth. To him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom, and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming in the, in the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the people of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone, like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of God. Thanks. Well, let's pray together as we come to God's word. Father, we come here this morning, and there are many things that have consumed our attention and our thinking but we pray, Lord, that we may study your word and that your Holy Spirit will open our eyes and will help us to focus so that we may form, that your word may form a foundation to our lives. So, Lord, take away all the things that are going through our minds, all the things that have consumed us this week and even this weekend, and help us to hear God's voice as we study God's word. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. Now, I don't need to tell you that the book of Revelation is a very happy hunting ground for any doomsday prophet, for any apocalypse movie, and for every other weirdo. You only have to go onto Amazon or Kum Books, and uh, you will find another, yet another book claiming that the book of Revelation is telling us about 2016 and the Middle East and Israel. Fortunately, uh, John, the author, the Apostle John, has given us certain controls which actually exclude all kinds of weird and bizarre interpretations of this book. We touched on a couple of them last week, but let me recap, especially if you weren't here last week. 
Let me give you four controls before we look at two characteristics of Jesus in this passage. Four key controls which will prevent us from misunderstanding this book. The first control is that, as I mentioned last week, what we have here is a letter. It's a book, but it's a letter. It was originally a letter that John wrote to seven churches. Notice verse 4, John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Notice verse 11, John who is in exile actually on the island of Patmos. Uh, Notice verse 11, he says, write on a scroll, that's the voice from heaven, God's voice, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. So what we have here is a letter written by the Apostle John. Remember, John was one of the 12 disciples. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And he received this vision from God, which he has written down, which brings us the book of Revelation. And he's writing around about 1890 AD. And he's writing to seven particular churches. They are mentioned there in the province of Asia modern-day Turkey. Now, like all the letters in the New Testament, letters by Paul, by Peter, by John, by James, all of those letters were written to particular people, particular Christians, particular churches in a particular context. But at the same time, they are written to us and to Christians throughout 2,000 years. So the truths were for those original readers but they also for Christians who have lived over 2,000 years. These truths are for all ages and all times. But it's a letter. Control number two is that John gives us a time control. So he gives us a time control in the passage. Notice verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Same thing, verse 19. Write, therefore, speaking to John, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. So John is telling the original first century uh, readers, these seven churches, what's going to happen now, what is going to soon take place, and what will take place later. So it's important that we understand, living in 2016, that this isn't just a book written for us. It is written for us. But it was originally written to these seven churches. It was relevant to them. What is going to happen now for them? What will happen soon for them? And what will take place later? So at the very least, what we have here in this letter is that um, the letter has to do with present reality for those first century believers It has to do with future history for those first century believers, and it has to do with the end times. So he's told us, he's writing to those first century Christians, he says what will happen now, what will happen soon in history, and what will happen at the end. And the end times are given to us there in Revelation 19 to the end of the book. So they're controls, it's not just written for Christians living in the 20th or 21st century. It was written to those original readers, it made sense to them, and it applied to them. Third control. John tells us that this is not normal literary history. It's not normal literal history. As we saw last week, the Bible is actually made up of different forms of literature, what we call literary genre. So you have historical narrative, you have poetry, you have parables, you have prophecy, you have songs, you have letters, and more. So not everything in the Bible is meant to be read literally. Not everything is literal history. So for instance, when Jesus says, I am the gate for the sheep, we do not read that literally. We don't say what kind of gate. Is it a wooden gate? Is it a steel gate? Is it a sliding gate? Is it electrified? No, no, no. We understand Jesus is speaking metaphorically. He is the gateway to know God. He is the entry point to salvation. Jesus says, I am the gate for the sheep. So we read that and say, my goodness me, this is only written for animals. It's not written for human beings. It's written for sheep and cattle, and doves, and chickens. No, 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 he's speaking metaphorically. 
You see that? Not everything can be read literally. It's not meant to be read literally. The technical term, as you remember from last week, for this kind of literature is called apocalyptic literature. You have that in the book of Daniel, you have that in the book of Ezekiel, you have that in the book of Zechariah, and in the book of Revelation. And as we saw, one of the characteristics of apocalyptic literature is that the author uses symbols to convey truth, symbolic language, picture language, symbols, metaphors. He uses drama, he uses music, he uses paint to convey truth, God's truth. In fact, John gives us a clue that that is how we are to read the book of Revelation. So I'm not just sucking that out of my thumb. thumb. It's not just my interpretation. No, John tells us, you must read the book of Revelation as apocalyptic literature. It has metaphors. It has drama. It has figures of speech. Notice verse 12. I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash round his chest. Then verse 14 and 15, we are given a description of the Son of Man. And then verse 16, we read, In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. So there are all kind of questions there. I mean, how do you hold a star in your hand? Uh, what are the lampstands? What do they mean? Well, we're actually told in verse 20. Have a look at verse 20. He says, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. You could read that. The seven stars are the, are the messengers of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So he's telling us there, you're not to read this literally. They're not real stars. No, the stars represent, they are, they are symbolic of God's angels, God's messengers. The lampstands, they are not real lampstands. No, 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 don't read that li literally. No, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So right here in chapter 1, John gives us a clue, a key clue. He says you can't read this thing literally. The stars mean God's angels, God's messengers. The lampstands are not real lampstands. They mean God's churches. So what we have here is truth. It is God's truth. But it's given to us in metaphors, in drama, in picture language. Now, my dear friends, if, if writers of books had, had, had understood that principle, we wouldn't have had thousands, thousands of books writing all kinds of weird rubbish. Because they didn't understand that we are not to read it literally, and John actually tells us not to read it literally. As I said last week, when Paul writes, he appeals to our sense of logic. When, when, when Luke write, writes, he appeals to our sense of history. When John writes, he appeals to our imagination. All right, control number four. John tells us what the purpose of this book is. So the purpose of this book is not a happy hunting ground for weirdos. That is not the purpose of this book. Where the, where the woman on the beast, this is a kind of a weirdo interpretation, may say something like this, obviously the woman on the beast must be Angela Merkel. Uh, obviously the mark of the beast must be the letters EU or Brexit. Um, obviously, the Antichrist must be Boris or Donald or George. Uh, I mean, what would that have meant to, to the original readers? Nothing. You see how weird that kind of way is of reading the book of Revelation. Now, the purpose of the book is to encourage this tiny group of believers, Christians, who were discouraged, who were confused, who were bewildered. They'd been taught rightly so, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. They were taught that he was the king, that he would conquer all kingdoms, that he would conquer sin and evil and death. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. The problem is, when they looked on BBC News, nothing had changed. The church was still a tiny minority being persecuted, oppressed by the Roman Empire. Sky News 
showed them images of the Roman Empire killing innocent people, sometimes genocide. Evil was prospering. Injustice was growing. CNN showed pictures of Christians being killed by wild animals in the Colosseum. And because these Christians refuse to say that Caesar is Lord, I mean, Christians can't say that because only Jesus is Lord. But because they refused to say Caesar is Lord, some of them were being persecuted. Some of them were in prison. Some of them were killed. Notice verse 9. John speaks about suffering. He speaks about the need for patient endurance. They were going through hard times. Look at chapter 2, verse 10. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. So John is writing to discouraged, bewildered, confused Christians whose hopes about Jesus had not materialized. And John reminds them in this vision, this book, that Christ has conquered sin and death on the cross that Christ's enemies, including the evil Roman Empire, will be destroyed, that evil and Satan will be annihilated, that Christ and his kingdom will triumph in the end. It's, it's really an affirmation, this book. It's an affirmation of the gospel, the ultimate triumph of the gospel over every ideology, every kingdom, every authority, big or small, that sets itself up against God. Now, of course, John had in mind the evil, godless Roman Empire. They were the Antichrist. They were the mother of all prostitutes. The regime, this, this regime, this ideology that sets itself up against God. But God's victory is clear. The Roman Empire fell. There's no Roman Empire. Even the Italians were beaten at soccer last night. <laughs> Where's the Greek Empire? Where's the Nazi Empire? Where's the Apartheid Empire? Gone. Footnote of history. Anyone who sets themselves up against God, any ideology, any authority, any, any, any person, any ruler will, will be judged by God. And the gospel will triumph. We live in a godless, godless Western world. It used to be much more Christian, but it no longer is, and it's gone so quickly, especially in Europe and, 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 and the UK. In Europe and, and the UK, many of you will know, there is a Christophobia. What does that mean? People are not just neutral about Jesus. They are not just uninterested in Jesus. They hate Jesus. That is the Western world. That's what's happening in parts of the USA. That's what's happening in parts of Europe, parts of the UK. People hate Jesus. They hate Christians. They hate the Bible. They hate us saying that Jesus is the only way. In fact, that has become hate speech. On Tuesday this week, a Church of England primary school in England changed their school badge because they didn't want to offend anybody. They took out the cross and they put a tree. The United Nations has a, has a Committee on Human Rights. In, in one of their documents, they say that Christian assemblies at schools undermine children's human rights. That's Christophobia. People hate Jesus. A lovely, lovely, excellent Christian school in the UK that I've had some comment with, two years ago, they were assessed by the Department of Education in the UK called Ofsted. They got a green light. They were told you are at a very high standard, you are doing well, well done. Two years later, last year, they got a green light. Sorry, they got a red light. And the reason is, so they were downgraded in terms of, of their status. And the reason was this Christian school, the reason was they didn't have a Muslim on the Board of Governors and secondly, they were not promoting the gay and transsexual lifestyle. So they were downgraded. 
Next year, they could be closed. That is Christophobia. That is a context we live in. And John says, hey guys, that's how it is. That's the territory. Don't be discouraged. It's part of belonging to Christ. Continue to love your neighbor. Continue to love your enemy. But in the end, Revelation tells us, God's enemies will be destroyed. Evil will be conquered. Christ and his kingdom will triumph. That's the great message. That's a great theme of this great book, Revelation. Just one last comment before we look at two characteristics of Jesus. There are many places in the Bible where symbols are used to convey truth, and especially here in the book of Revelation. Now, we all know what symbols are. So, for instance, we have a symbol at almost every street corner. It's called a traffic light, and it's a symbol. Here in Gauteng, if you're not from Gauteng, this is how it works. In Gauteng, green means go, orange means go very fast, <laughs> and red means it's optional. <laughs> okay, that is a symbol. We know what red, orange, green stands for. It's not just red, orange, and green. It means something. Here in Gauteng, when it says 120, what it actually means is don't go over 140. That's what it means. Okay, but it's a symbol, it's a sign. So you have lots of symbols in the book of Revelation which point us to a particular truth. So there's symbols throughout the Bible and this book uh, that come from the Old Testament. Many of the symbols here in, 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 in uh, Revelation come from the Old Testament. They have an Old Testament root. Some of the symbols would have been understood clearly in the first century, but we no longer understand it, and that's why we need to understand what they understood. And then there are symbols that we are not quite sure what they mean yet. Um, the more we know about archaeology and history and culture and language, one day we will understand those things. But there are a couple of symbols that are not so clear, and we need to understand that. Let me give you one example. Let's take numbers. So numbers in the book of Revelation, generally speaking, not in all cases, but in most cases, numbers are not numbers. They represent something. They mean something. So, for instance, the number seven in the Bible is often, quite often, used to mean complete. It's used to mean good. It's be used to mean completeness. So, we have the seven days of creation in Genesis chapter 1. It's the complete period of God's work in creating. We have the seven Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, which tells us, if you want complete blessing, here's the source. Here's where you find it. Verse 11, notice, this letter is written to seven churches. Actually, there were ten churches in Asia, modern-day Turkey. But he talks about seven churches. So obviously he's writing to those churches, but he's actually saying this message is for the complete universal church of Jesus Christ through all the ages. It's a message for us all. It's universal. Verse 4, the seven spirits. He's not talking about seven spirits in the Godhead. No, he, uh, that would refer to the complete effective work of the one Holy Spirit. So if seven means complete, if it means good, if it means completeness, then six. Six means bad. Six means incomplete. So the number 666 that you get in the book of Revelation means completely, totally, utterly bad, evil. I mean, that's obvious. If 7 means good, complete, then 6 is not complete. Take the number 12. The number 12 means whole. It means united. Remember, in chapter 7, verse 4, we are told that only 144,000 people will be in heaven. Now, my dear friends, that's less than all the real Christians in Gauteng in 2016, let alone any other year or age, let alone any other country. It's symbolic. So in the Old Testament, so it includes the Old Testament and the New Testament believers. The Old Testament is represented, the Old Testament believers are represented by the 12 tribes of Israel. 
The New Testament believers, including us, is represented by the 12 apostles. 12 times 12 is 144. 144,000 means that the whole united universal church of God, Old and New Testament believers, all of us, no one left behind, will be with Christ in heaven. That's what it means. All right, let's quickly have a look at two characteristics of Jesus. Those are four controls, four keys that help us to get a handle on this book. If you miss them, you're going to get it wrong. It's how it is. Two characteristics of Jesus. Last week, we, 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 we also looked at two characteristics of Jesus in this passage. Jesus as king and Jesus as God. This week, I want us to have a look at two other characteristics of Jesus. Jesus, the son of man, and Jesus, the lover. And remember, this is not only for those seven churches. It's for us. It's not only for those seven churches going through hard times, it's for us going through hard times. Maybe your family, maybe your marriage, maybe your work, your studies. This is for us. Jesus, the Son of Man, Jesus, the Lover. Have a look firstly, Jesus, the Son of Man, verse 12. I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash round his chest. His head and hair were white like, sn white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance." So what we have here is a vision. It's a vision that God gave to John. It is supernatural, God revealing himself. The first image there, verse 12, are seven golden lampstands, which we are told, do uh, remember verse 20, they are the seven churches. Now, of course, that's not a new image of the church. Jesus told us in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. So it's no surprise that the church is called lampstands. So there we have the seven lampstands, the seven churches. Verse 13, there's someone standing amongst the seven churches. So Jesus hasn't disappeared. He's not only seated at the right hand of God in heaven. No, his Holy Spirit is here with us. He's standing amongst us. And there's someone standing called the Son of Man. Now, once again, that's a symbolic name. It points to two things. It points to the humanity of Christ. And Jesus often used that, you remember, in the Gospels, calling himself the Son of Man. But it also points to the deity of Jesus. So have a look quickly with me. Daniel chapter 7. Have a look in your index. That's what it's there for. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Here is the first instance, the first usage of the term Son of Man that Jesus then uses for himself. We told the Son of Man is standing amongst the lampstands. Here we have the first, first description of that Son of Man. Let me read to you just verse 13 and 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So on the one hand, he's the son of man. He's human. But verse 14 talks about the deity of the son of man. I mean, all those things belong to God. He has all authority, glory, sovereign power. Everyone will worship him. His dominion is an everlasting one that will not pass away. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Well, what is that? That's talking about God. So the Son of Man is both human and divine at the same time. Back to Revelation chapter 1. The features of the Son of Man, the robe, the white hair, the blazing eyes, the bronze feet, the voice, all taken from Daniel 7 and Daniel 10. You can check it up. 
which point to Christ as both king and priest. Verse 16, out of his mouth is a double-edged sword. Now, most people who swallow swords have the sharp edge going inwards. I always cringe. I so worry what's going to happen. But here the sharp double-edged sword is pointing outwards. And it's a clue that God's greatest weapon in spiritual warfare is the word. Remember Paul said, Ephesians 6, that, that the sword of the spirit is the word of God. Well, obviously, what is the response of John? Well, it's one of fear. I mean, this is extraordinary. Here's someone who holds seven stars in his hands. His face was like the signing shun. You couldn't even look at him. He fell at his feet as though dead when he placed, then he placed his right hand on me. So, so John falls down in fear. He's terrified. Jesus says, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead. And behold, I will, I'm alive forever and ever and hold the keys of death and Hades. Right now, you may say to me, Martin, life has been tough this year. It's been an unbelievable year. There's been crisis after crisis, problem after problem. I wonder where God is. There seems to be no end. And Jesus stands amongst his people. The Son of Man stands next to the lampstands, God's people. And he says, do not be afraid. If you belong to me, you're safe. You're safe. I hold the keys to life and death and everything in between. And all these things may be happening. And to all appearances, it seems as if evil is winning. But take heart. I'm the king. I'm the Lord. I'm the Alpha and Omega. I'm the Son of Man. All authority, all dominion belongs to me. And one day, the, the gospel, my gospel, will triumph over all sin and evil. Lastly, will you notice that Jesus is not only the Son of Man, Jesus is the lover. Have a look at that verse 4. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kingdoms of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Now what an extraordinary statement. What an extraordinary concept, verse 5. The firstborn from the dead, the Alpha and Omega, the one who has always existed, the one who will always exist, the creator of the entire universe, the ruler over all kings and all authorities, end of, end of verse 5, is the one who loves us. I mean, that's an extraordinary concept, isn't it? The creator of the universe knows you and loves you. If I tried to call the king of the Zulus, or the Queen of England, or Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift. <laughs> Obviously, they wouldn't have a clue who I am. I mean, they wouldn't return my call. Who is this nameless pastor from Midrand? They're VIPs. They are celebrities. They're important people. They don't take calls from unimportant people. Nothing wrong with that. We understand that. And yet we told you that the creator of the universe, the ruler of all the kings, authorities of all time, not only knows you, but he loves you. How do you know that he loves you? Well, we told there, he freed me from my sins, my guilt. He freed me from God's wrath by his blood on the cross. So the great high priest Jesus lays down his life by dying on the cross, by shedding his blood, so that all of us together, verse 6, notice, could be a kingdom. We could all be priests, which means we have direct access into the presence of God. Priests are those who are supposed to be mediators between man and God. Jesus is the great high priest. When we trust in him, we become priests. We have direct access into the presence of God through Jesus. 
That's why, my dear friends, we don't need other mediators. We don't need Mary. We don't need uh, the saints. We don't need the ancestors. No, we have direct access into the presence of God through Jesus, who loves us. Like all of us, there are times when I get depressed, discouraged, downhearted. We all have that, don't we? I usually, not always, but I usually tell God how I feel. And then I remember that someone died for me. Imagine that. Think about it. Somebody died for me. He died for me. He was 33 years old. He died for me because he loved me. Perhaps your whole life, in word or action, you've been told you're nothing. You're a failure. You're a loser. You'll amount to nothing. You're not wanted. Perhaps you feel that. Perhaps you were told that 20, 30, 40 years ago, but you still remember it as clear as yesterday, what your father said. And God breaks into our existential cycle of misery and lostness, lostness and loneliness. And God says, I love you. I love you. I love you so much that I died for you. Remember that story of that poor South American family? It's a true story. Teenage daughter ran away from home to escape the poverty that she was living in, went to the city. Eventually landed up in prostitution. She was enslaved by drugs, by a pimp, by poverty. But her mother never gave up hope. For years, she would print photostat pictures of her daughter, and underneath was written, wherever you are, whatever you've done, come home, love, mom. Well, that's God's message to us. Wherever you are, whatever you've done, come home, love, dad. What an extraordinary gospel. In all the brokenness of this world, in all the brokenness of our own lives, in times when we are filled with discouragement, we disheartened, we have someone who loves us. We know he loves us. Not because everything's going right, it's not. We know he loves us because he died for us. Wouldn't today be a good day if you've never turned to him and trusted in him to come to the end of yourself? So, oh God, will you have mercy on me? Let's pray. Let's spend a few moments of quiet as we reflect on God's word. You may want to tell God where you are. Father, if we're honest, all of us forget these great truths. There are times, Lord, we forget that you love us more than we can imagine. There are times that we forget that you are actually in control. That if we look into world history, all those godless empires, ideologies, authorities, dictators, regimes have come and gone, just as your word says. Thank you, Father, that your gospel will triumph, whatever the appearances. Forgive us, Lord, when we for forget that you hold the keys to life and death and everything in between. Forgive us, Lord, when we forget that you love us so much that you died for us. You died for us. 
Father, this morning there may be someone who wants to say, Lord, I've come to the end of myself. Will you save me? Will you make me a Christian? Will you rescue me? And Father, we thank you that when we turn to you with all our questions and doubts, but call on you for mercy, that you hear and you answer and you give new life. Work amongst us this, e this morning, we pray. Work amongst us this coming week, we pray. May it be a great week for children and teenagers and adults turning to Christ. So, Lord, go with us into this week. Help us to serve you and love you and obey you wherever you've placed us. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, you've been very patient. Just one or two things before we close. Do remember, in two weeks' time, God willing, we'll pick up Revelation chapter 4. So do read chapter 2, 3, and 4 before two weeks' time. If you need prayer, we have prayer counselors who can help you and pray with you. Perhaps you want to get right with God. Perhaps you have heavy burdens and you need someone just to listen and to pray with you. We have prayer counselors in the prayer room on your left-hand side. There's coffee on the verandas. Uh, perhaps you'd like to have a lovely hot lunch or breakfast in the cafeteria or the courtyard cafe. Uh, do go through for that. And uh, we'll be back next week. God bless you. Have a good week.